Hey everybody, welcome to the Sobriety Diaries. I'm your host, Nate Kelly, a recovering alcoholic seven years from my last drink, a recovery mentor and podcast producer. I am so grateful to be bringing you these powerful stories of recovery told by you, those who live them. Please share this podcast with anyone who may need it today. And with that, let's open the diary on episode 93. I am here with my new friend, Sonia Callen. Sonia, happy Saturday. How are you, my friend? I am good, Nate. Happy Saturday to you. Thank you so much. What made you sort of decide to recover out loud and make this a part of your life? Yeah, I mean, so I grew up like, I mean, uh, my parents are Indian immigrants. And so it's not something you would ever typically talk about. Um, There's no such thing as addiction with Indian people or like mental illness. So um, what's interesting is then I also like married somebody who sort of felt that way. That was sort of like, just Mm. pull yourself up by your bootstraps and keep it all sort of hidden and secret. Yeah, like, um, like very tough love. Like if you have a problem, fix it right? And fix it in private. And so um, when that relationship ended really shockingly, it somehow just like pushed me out into this sort of like more open space where before I've been like writing about sobriety and making images about sobriety, but they're kind of more easily hidden that it was about me. It could have been about my brother or one of my uncles. And so Something about that relationship ending, I don't think I consciously thought, well, I'm going to like live out loud now, but it just, the pain was so significant that I kind of had to tell people I'm now struggling with my sobriety with this new situation. So I think that's sort of how it started. I love what you're doing with Everbloom. And of course, we will talk about that and things we can offer our listeners. But I really like to get a portrait of Sonia and talk about what led us to today. So start with your story, start wherever makes sense, and let us know what your journey was like from addiction and from that feeling of secrecy to letting the world know. So let's hear more about Sonia. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's that unusual. I started smoking when I was 13 and drinking when I was 15. I was very insecure, anxious kid. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of chaos like in my house. And so the minute I, the first time I drank, I was like, this is amazing. This is like it. all of a sudden, <laughs> like all this is it. Like, this is what I was meant to be doing my whole life. Like, why does now it feels, everything just feels so much easier. Cause I always had had this feeling like, why are things so hard for me? Like, why are like social situations so hard for me? And Mm. so, yeah, I I finally felt like I fit in and, uh, you know, I kept binge drinking. I went to college and I was able to like kind of flow between so many different groups of people while I was drinking very heavily. And so You know, I think when you're around people that also drink, it's really easy to not, you know, think you have a problem. And so, yeah, not everyone was getting their stomach pumped in the ER or like losing their keys or their wallet or waking up like face down with like a bloody nose. Well, I lost my car at one point. So if it was just keys for you, you're ahead of me. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And also, like, I don't know if you feel this way, I was so high functioning where I still did very well in school and for the most part looked really well. Like I didn't look like I was, you know, I didn't have like circles under my eyes. Like I was just like living it. And so I think that it was easy to get away with it for a really long time. And I kept doing that. I was in school for a really long time. So it just sort of moderated the frequency of my drinking. So I wasn't drinking every day. I was just like binge drinking every few weeks. And so when I started working full time and I, I was running a business, um, I like started a business, was growing it. It was the only thing I knew how to cope. And so I started drinking daily and I was drinking really heavily for about a decade. And I got really, really lucky where um, my business grew and scaled to a point where there was a lot of interest in buying it. And so I sold it. And when I sold it, I was like, I have no coping mechanisms 
for stress. I have no hobbies. My relationships were strained with like family. I wasn't super close. I had like three nieces and a brother and two sister-in-laws and and I was like, what am I going to do? And and also, if I'm getting home from work at earlier, or if I'm you know not working, I was always working before. Like, what am I? Am I going to start drinking at like noon? <laughs> so, so did you I sell the didn't... business then with zero involvement, or were you still no, involved in stayed, any way? Yeah, I still was going to stay for two years, which I did, but. If you compare the level of working like, you know, 14, 16 hours a day to kind of going to like a nine to five job where you're more yeah. a consultant than making big decisions. And so it was such a shift that I just felt like sort of lost, but also knew very, felt very deeply like I had to make a change like something had to change because if I wanted this sort of life that I had like dreamt about, like there was, this was not it. And so, and I had all the resources now. So I was like, what are you doing? Like, just get to it. And so I thought about it for a few months and just said, let me, let me just try at like a day will come in the next couple of months. Well, you'll, you'll just be like, okay, because nothing major was happening. Like I wasn't getting a DUI. I wasn't you know, no one was saying, I think you have a drinking problem. So those kind of like interventions weren't happening. And so you know that there's an issue, yeah. but if other people aren't recognizing or questioning it, then it's really an internal sort of integrity thing, or, or it's just sort of a next yes. level. It is. And then it's, so it's an integrity thing, but then it's also something where you're in charge of labeling yourself, right? And yeah. then telling people like, this is the, so I'm going to refer to myself as yeah. an alcoholic and it's tough. I, I'm, I'm happy. It's weird. I think that high functioning is, is like a gift in some senses, but I think it's also can be such a huge negative because you can go, you can keep doing it for so long. Like right. I, it's double edged for sure. And really it is because low functioning, it's like, well, you're not going to be able to sleep on a park bench forever. Like, let's get <laughs> right. going, you know, or like, you're not going to be able to keep, you know, getting arrested multiple times and not realize you have a problem. And I always think like I was one bad night away mm. from that consequence, but I just like, I don't know. It was like my path was to have to figure it out for myself. And so, yeah, I just was at brunch with a girlfriend of mine who was pregnant one Sunday and I had a vicious hangover, like the type where you're like seeing spots and like Ugh. no amount of water or greasy food or no anything cure. is going to fix it. And um, no cure. And <laughs> the waiter was like, do you want a mimosa? And I was like, no, I do not want a mimosa. And I don't think I'd ever said no to a drink in like 20 years. And so <laughs> I remember sort of like in that moment, not knowing what I was doing, but like playing the tape forward and being like, if I have a mimosa now, I have to keep drinking pretty much for the rest, steadily for the rest of the day. And then I will wake up Monday morning and have a raging hangover. And then right. I'm going to have to drink Monday night. And then I'm, you know, and then the cycle would start again. The cycle I had been in for a decade, but um, I just thought like, I, I just can't, I just can't do it anymore. And I was really lucky that my um, symptoms when I stopped were not super significant. Like I was definitely yeah. like jittery and uncomfortable and like crawling out of my skin, but not like medically, like didn't need any medical intervention. That's great for someone that, you know, it was decades long to not need medical intervention or, you know, even an inpatient treatment facility that I, I didn't trust myself to do that. I knew that I needed to be locked away from booze because I lived alone and I had that uh, internal fight with myself and I didn't have the integrity yet. Uh, so I had to lock myself away. So kudos to you for you. for that part of your recovery. I think there's also an age, like I was, I was probably significantly older when I quit, right? And so okay. I, I think I was like 38, I think when I quit. But if you're like 25, it's like, yeah. it is hard to, you know, see like, 
I want this life. Like I have the opportunity to have, it just seems so abstract, I think. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, I mean, so many factors, you're living situation do you have roommates or a spouse or your parents who consume you know there, there are so many factors that play into it yes yeah, so i was just really lucky and so i my brother was in aa um at the time and had been for about six seven years and, and so he was a great support and um but there still was no option. My husband was ex-husband now, but at the time was like, there's absolutely no way you're going to a meeting anywhere near where we live. And I sort of, and he's like, I don't really think like, do we really need to use the word alcoholic? You're not like your brother type thing. Um, and I, that's when I, I'm like, no, there's a difference between there. It's still alcoholism. There's just a right. difference between like low function and high function. Like that's all this is. It's not that I don't have a problem. And so, yeah, I kind of just found my own outlets. I feel like for it, I just did everything I had ever wanted to do. I like took writing classes. I took photography classes. I started spending a ton of time um, with my nieces um, who are now, oh my God, 19, 17 and eight. And so mm, yeah. um, I was became a big part of their lives. And so it just like, and then I started getting involved with nonprofits and volunteering. And that's, I think when my like purpose started to kind of form and like, I just started to shift into realizing how lucky I was in so many different ways. And that I had to give back. Like we are all literally one bad night, one step, one bad decision away from where people who need our help are. Right. And so, so I just wanted to, yeah, to have some sort of impact. And so, yeah, that's what I did. And that was sort of like my pathway, I guess. And I was doing great for about five years. Um, I was like, this is amazing. Like, I think I found my purpose. And slowly, I didn't really see it. But my ex-husband was kind of going in the opposite direction where he wanted to do another startup. And he wanted to be investing in startups and it didn't matter if they had a social impact. And, and you were I still married at this point. Yeah, we were married. Okay. And so for those five years, he just, you could, I couldn't feel it that our values were sort of diverging. I think that I thought it was cute. Like our friends thought it was cute. Like, oh, like you keep him grounded. Like, what would he be like without you? He'd be like choppering to the Hamptons on the weekend. Like that's the kind of <laughs> stuff right. he wanted to do. And so, um, and I think now that I see it, I, I wasn't keeping him grounded. I was holding him back, back from what he really, what type of life he really wanted. Um, I thought we were doing fine and he literally woke up one day. Like, I know people think this doesn't happen, but it does. Like we were, we had dinner the night before. We walked our dogs, we slept in the same bed, we didn't have an argument, and we woke up and he was like, I'm leaving. I need, you know, I need to just, I need to get out of here. I need to like figure out who I am. And um, I think in the back of my mind, I thought he'll probably come back at some point. Um, but he didn't. And, but I, yeah, I just, for the first time in five years, I thought I don't know how to stay sober through this. This is not what I have been working towards. Wow. Was there any sense of relief in it or was it just surprise and devastation? Just like a devastation I didn't even know was possible. And I thought like I had a shitty childhood. I had a rough alcohol journey. <laughs> How much worse could it get? Right. Gosh. And this was the hardest thing I had ever gone through. Like he was, I'm from Canada. And so I, you know, we were living in New York and he was my family. Like his family was my family. I had like, he was Jewish. I had sort of adopted his culture. I didn't really have my own, you know, cultural identity as much. And so I had, and we had never, ever talked about breaking up in 18 years, ever. Wow. Like not even, oh not the God. day before, not the week before. Like if you had told me the week before i would have said yeah right but you're crazy you're crazy 18 years wow yeah and in his defense like i was a very different person when we met right like i was like 
the life of the party. And I turned out to be a pretty introverted person. And like my idea of fun was like watching housewives with like a tiny dog on my lap and Sounds not amazing. I know, but like not going, <laughs> not going to the club. And, right. and I, I understand that, that we change. And so I think now I'm starting to understand that this is okay, that it happened, that I really didn't need to spend the rest of my life with someone with such different like value system. Um, I still, I still think that, you know, people should try to work things out. Like I, yeah. I definitely don't like, I, I don't know if I'm grateful yet for it, but I think I will be one day. <laughs> Do you have any additional clarity now on what happened or why yeah. such a rash yeah. decision? So on his way sort of out the door, he said a few things that I think in a way I didn't want to hear. I mean, he said, yeah, you, you're really introverted. Um, and he said, you're so close to your family, your nieces and your sister-in-laws, you don't feel the need to really expand your social circle. And he was right. I'm not like an acquaintance person at all. Yeah. Like I'll go, I like going to dinner with like two other couples or one, you know, or a few friends. And um, I don't want to go to big parties and things like that. And I will, if I have to, if it's like a nonprofit thing, but it's not my thing. And um, yeah. And, and he said, you know, you're just happy with too little, like you're, you're, you're happy with your little life essentially. And um, I didn't really want to hear it that day or that week. And then when I started to sort of realize, okay, this is really over. Um, he had been seeing somebody else. Um, and what was really kind of great about finding that out was that person was like the polar opposite of me. And I don't know why, but it just gave me some peace yeah. that it, I, I don't know how to explain it, but it was like, thank you for picking not a better version of me. <laughs> right. Like I could <laughs> never be her. Like if that's what he needs, yes. then at least it makes a little sense. Yes. Like it was like, oh, thank you. Because that was not, that's not an option here. Um, mm. And so that is someone who's like drinks, you know, heavily, probably almost daily. Someone who goes out almost every night and super, you know, materialistic and like him. And I was like, oh, and I think it gave, I know my sister-in-laws were like, let him go. Like, let the, that's what he wants. Like, let him go. So yeah, I yeah. think there have been some real, I feel like there's been some lucky kind of things that have happened for me. I didn't like suffer with like, like raging jealousy or, you know, that type of thing, which I, I don't even know what I would have done. With that. So five years in this huge life event, how do you take some of the tools or personal development that you learned in those five years than to start putting one foot in front of the other? I mean, it was rough the first few weeks, like the tools went out the window. And yeah. that's why I think I was so close probably to drinking again. I was like, I'm really into the the halt, the hungry, angry. And yeah. I was like, I was, wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. Um, so upset and lonely. I wanted to isolate myself. Um, and so just slowly, what was, I couldn't believe it even worked. I thought like, I'm not going to journal or meditate my way out of this. I'm not going to like Pilates Stop my way journal, out of this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to light my candles. I was like, I'm going to light this <laughs> house on fire. Right. Um, and so somehow though, like that sort of discipline though, did kind of creep back in. And so like, honestly, the fifth day I like exercised and like, like the 10th day I was like, I'm going to make a healthy meal. And like the second week I started journaling. And so all the like little things and also knowing that me sitting and like on a couch, not taking a shower, like was not an option. Like that for me was like, I had to like get up every day I'm going to walk the dogs. I'm going to call people. I, you know, I'm going to go out as hard as it is. And even if it's just for like 10 minutes, I'm going to, I have to keep some sort of connection, um, to, to those like practices. Right. And so to life and to life. Yeah. And so I did, I was like, I was still kind of like running my life. Like I was still like doing it, but with great difficulty. And so, um, 
I decided to start going to meetings and um, they were like non 12 step meetings online. And I was so comforted by them. It was, but they were like 200 people on a zoom screen. And I went, you know, every day at 8am. Yeah. And it, but they were great meetings, but, and that was fine also for the first like couple of months. Like I didn't want to share. I didn't want to, I was just in such pain and I wouldn't have been able to get the words out. And so it was just kind of nice logging in every morning and listening to people and getting inspiration and feeling like, okay, if, a lot of these people would do anything to have five years of sobriety. So mm-hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to do this for one more day. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it for them and do it for Amy in the corner in the upper right corner of the yes. zoom screen for one yes. more day. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And so, and then when, did you ever have the thought of, um, you know, I'm not going to let him win or give him the satisfaction of me sitting yeah. on this couch and not showering. Did that motivate you at all? Yeah, I think at the beginning, it was like, um, I mean, you have some pretty like some thoughts that are not rational. And so mine was like, sure. well, I've got to like, look good and be normal for when he comes back. Mm. Right. So that was probably what kept me going for a couple of weeks. Like, well, when he comes back, I should, you yeah. know, I shouldn't have been, you know, I, I should be like a full person, like a full, <laughs> I should not be a shell of myself. And so that and then for sure. It turned into, I am going to own also all those things he didn't like about me because I worked so hard for those things. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to own it. I'm going to own being introverted. I'm going to own being close to my family and I'm going to own being happy with too little. I am going to run with that because that, I think it sounded like an insult at the time, but I think that's amazing that I'm happy with so little. I don't think that it's is, too little. It, but... That is a superpower, actually. And I love that you, yeah. that you started to embrace that. Yeah, I'm happy with, um, you know, like a handful of close friends. I'm happy with I have like a beautiful home like that. I, I don't need, you know what I mean? I'm happy with yeah. like driving to Toronto to see my nieces and just like hanging out like just hanging out you know if he's there it's like let's all go to the four seasons but now it's like let's just sit on the couch and talk about boys or girls or yeah so that um yeah yeah so that definitely that idea that i'm going to show him um yeah i felt that i still feel it in a sense that i i owe it to myself to be the best version of me now because i don't have like maybe he was holding me back in a sense, right? Also, absolutely, and yeah. So I'm gonna have I ha I owe it to like everyone, and I owe it to my nieces who I want to be a role model for to sort of like make something out of this. How long do you think it was until you know you thought if he does come back, uh, you know I don't I don't want him or I won't accept it. I don't want him to come back. How long do you think that lasted? so much longer than I told anyone. Um, So I, um, when I found out about the other relationship, I filed for divorce. And even then, I didn't um, feel that I felt like, well, he comes back and is so sorry, and you know, shows up with a couples therapist and uh, will be so probably um, five months, six months, it took okay. to say, even if he comes back, but that I was still in significant pain. Like I was still crying every day, but still and knew that, no, I would not take him back. At, I at think five point. or six months. I mean, that it, for an 18 year relationship and a spouse, I think that's completely reasonable. And I, and I only ask to sort of give others perhaps who are yes. in the same situation, hope and motivation yes. that it won't last forever. There is something that I don't know if it's me because my personality, but there is something about being like, I'm, why am I not further? Why am I, and I can't, I I still do it. It's been over a year and I still think, well, I, I haven't even dated. I'm not dating and everyone else dates after a year. And it's, and I, and it is something I not obsess about, but like, I have to control that. And so I hope if anyone's listening, it's like, let it take as long as you can. I have you know, 
friends that like didn't date for 10 years after their divorce. My friends who dated three months after their divorce. And so, yeah. And, and I think it is, it also is like about like how happy you were in the relationship too. I thought I was really happy. Right. So to have to kind of like, in a sense, feel like you're backtracking and like redirecting took, it's taking a long time for me. And so. Or even yeah. like reevaluating what happiness is or what your happiness looks like. And I think too, one thing when I'm really hard on myself, I think about what someone said to me, they're like, I think probably around like eight, nine months, I was like, I feel like I haven't gotten anywhere. Like I would have like, you know, a crying day and feel like I can't believe I'm still here. And, and someone said, like, I don't think you realize like you started, I'm going to draw something, but like you started at the bottom of this mountain and it just, you're going up and down, but your overall trajectory is up. And right. so the, the down days would feel like I was all the way back to day one. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but they, it wasn't, yeah, it was like, no, you've learned so much. You're you know, you're significantly better off. But yeah, it was, yeah, that's an interesting, I do, I do talk about it a lot. Like, why am I not X, Y, Z? Why am I not sure. like eat, pray, love? When am I going to eat, pray, love? When's <laughs> yeah, that happening? Eat, pray, love moment. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so I guess when or during this journey was the, the seed planted for Ever bloom. I guess you you've got that entrepreneurial spirit, as we've heard in your story. So when did the idea for the next thing sort of come, or was that where you were able to put all of this energy and emotion? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it was kind of all of it. Like I, I um hadn't been looking for like the next big thing in a few years. I was really enjoying um the break from having a business, and so. Um, I was going to the meetings. And so at some point I really wanted to share, I like wanted some, you know, feedback and I realized, well, this isn't the forum for that. There's 200 people you have to like raise your zoom hand. Yeah. You vent that you set a timer, you vent, and then the next person goes. And then what the next person says has no relation to what you said, no one right. is responding. And so I thought, okay, well, let me look for something. And so of course, like I, you know, I checked out AA and I was like, Oh, what do you mean no crosstalk? What? <laughs> I'm looking for crosstalk. Yes. And and so I and I and I wanted something like a looser too than like, you know, talking about like steps or like the excerpt of, you know, from the book. And so and I love AA, is not it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so um I kept looking and I was like, how does this not exist? Like, how did a small group sort of like ping-ponging like discussion? not exist. And so I looked and looked and then I um my sister-in-laws at some point last summer were like you need to I live in the middle of the woods when I'm not in um Toronto with my family and so I live in Pennsylvania and so they were like you need to get out of there. Like <laughs> keep going back there and like you need to get out, go do something. And so like go do some yeah, like an eat pray love. And so I went sure. to a healing retreat in Costa Rica and I was not happy. Like I was upset on the flight. I've never been, I hadn't been on vacation by myself in almost 20 years. Wow. I was upset checking in. I was upset at my first meal alone <laughs> at the resort. And I slept like, luckily I hadn't been sleeping well. So I slept like 15 hours the first day. Mm. And I kind of woke up the next day feeling like, okay, okay, like, let's do this. And I, um, it was so beautiful. I was like in the middle of like a cloud forest and I had this like beautiful like hanging chair. And so I just kind of, I took the journal out and it's funny because I still have the journal and it's like, it's dated like, this is the second day in Costa Rica and my mm -hmm. first journal entry. Um, and I just started thinking like, what is it that you need? Like, what are you missing? You have like, like such like loving people that would do anything for you. You have like, you know, you're not struggling now financially because your husband left, like you're so fucking lucky and you're sitting here like whining. You're in Costa Rica. Get at your a big resort. girl panties on. Yeah. Pull up your boots. Let's go. Let's go. And then I thought, okay, but something is stopping me. And I said, like, I think it's that this sobriety thing is kind of tough. And so the idea that I, I didn't want to burden 
my sister-in-laws um, or my friends with, hey, I'm worried I'm going to drink, right? Like it was already enough, like burdening them with my sort of like the, the fallout from the end of this relationship. So I thought, you know, I haven't talked about it. I haven't talked about how much I want to drink and how I think that would solve all my problems. And hmm. so I thought, okay, so I want to be able to talk to people that are also struggling with sobriety. I am not getting that in the current groups that I've attended. What does it look like? And so I just like, I remember I started mapping it out in my journal and I like made a big circle that said like sober in the center. And then I put like just different spokes out. And I thought like, what are the issues I've struggled with? And I thought, well, I had like really bad imposter syndrome. Um, now I'm going through this, having to rebuild my life. Um, I had job burnout and, and I thought like, these could all kind of be their own group of like 10, 15 people, like mm. who are experiencing these things. They don't have to be super specific. Like we can, you know, group, like I think empty nesting, divorce, um, and like, there's some other, like a light, like career change. They're sort of in the same, right? you know, let's rebuild a life thing. And so, and then there's also like the first, like six months of sobriety is like a thing, all of its own. And totally its own the, thing. Totally its own. Like you need to have your own group and <laughs> you don't yeah. need somebody there whining about their husband, right? Like you right. need somebody who's like, take a deep breath, uh, like take it minute to minute when you're having a craving, right? Not like, yeah. So I thought, well, let me keep working on this idea um, and see where I get. And so I kept working on it, working on it. And then um, because I had like was in sort of like the startup scene, I was like, why don't I join a business accelerator? Because my whole thing is that I need community, right? Like this. And so I was like, I need a community. I know how to run a business, but I, I want a community. And so I joined the accelerator and it was awesome. Like they take you through this process. And so it kind of like gave me something to do every day that was like very finite. And the best, when I really started to kind of come alive again was when the accelerator was like, you have to interview a hundred people, potential customers. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do that's, this. That's sort of daunting. Yeah. But it makes sense, right? If you can get totally. an idea, is this missing right in the current recovery space would people sign up are they interested and so yeah i mean look the the, the like ideal like person who's going to sign up for everbloom is probably not like a 55 year old white guy who's been in aa for 20 years probably <laughs> right. not but you are no, more than not welcome. an old timer yes no you're more than welcome but um but there are so many pockets of people that didn't fit into like the existing space and a lot where i i interviewed this is the craziest thing i interviewed multiple witches by accident and wow. i was like by the third witch i was like would you go to a sober <laughs> witches group and they were like you would absolutely go to a sober yeah, witches of course. group They're and then um yearning for witch groups <laughs> group and dif different things that people were like, you know, I would like with my sort of when I talk about sobriety for people to also understand this about me. Right. And so like for me, when I talk about my sobriety, I want people to, yeah, understand that I've gone through something that like knocked me the fuck down, like where right. I am still struggling with self-esteem and things like that from it. And so, um, yeah, so I went through that process and was like, okay, I have something. And my mentor was like, this is something I, I this is something because all these people were responding. So yeah, I started taking signups um, before around Christmas, um, and then launched it in the new year. And there are people which is like the best feeling ever They're coming. <laughs> They're coming. So join everbloom.com. Where else can people find you online, Sonia, if they want to reach out or if they're yeah. inspired by today's conversation? Yeah, for sure. So I um I try to like post like a little video of inspiration every day on um Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Um, and so we're either Everbloom, B-O-U-M-E, or join Everbloom on every um platform. Amazing. And we went viral on TikTok a few weeks ago. <gasps> yeah. I don't know how it, I don't understand why or how it there, TikTok it's it's like the wild wild west there's no rhyme or reason to it <laughs> so good job I was like <laughs> um I was like like my nieces are like teenagers I was like what's going on what's I was like why do I have why do I have 500,000 views like what is that what <laughs> wow. like my normally get like 
2,000. And I'm right. like, what, why am I at 750,000 views? Good for you. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Sonia, thank you so much for your time today. It was worth the wait. I loved our conversation. Oh. We'll link everything in today's show notes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nate. This was so fun. Thanks so much for listening today, friend. Hopefully you heard something that resonates with you. And if we help just one person, our job is done. Make sure you check today's show notes for all the information discussed in today's episode and how to connect with our guests. Until next Wednesday, try your best not to drink and be good to yourself. Bye, everyone.